Uh, I'm glad to be here. I wish I was in Spain, but I'm glad to be here as uh, Pastor Ben's over there. Um, I mean, seems to be preaching quite a bit, so there's a move of God happening over there. That's pretty, pretty awesome. Um, I'm going to preach once, but it'll be about the length of two, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, I'm closing out this series, uh, A Quiet Life, Leading a Quiet Life. I think um, I'm an expert at this, not because I'm quiet, uh, but because, because I, I enjoy my little, my little back room. I have a closet classroom, kind of tucked away in the basement of Northville Christian School, and I get to teach there. Right? I get to stay in my little corner of the school, and nobody gets to... I'm not, you know, now I'm up on the stage. I prefer the room. I prefer the little side room. That's a quiet life. I like it down there. Um, but uh, today, we're going to talk not only about living a quiet life in the sense of, you know, uh, contentment, um, in the sense of keeping to yourself, kind of minding your own business, like Paul's asking the Thessalonians to do. Uh, we're going to talk about why we're going to live a quiet life and what Jesus expects of us in the context to Paul's letter to uh, the Thessalonians. So, uh, if you're with me here in uh, chapter 4, we'll begin. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so much more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. If you've ever wondered, what, what is God's will for my life? It is that you be sanctified. That's about, that, that's his will. Um, it's not the job. It's not whatever college, you know, what, what does God want for me? He wants you to be sanctified. That's his, that's his main will, we could say. That's your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you, knows how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one trespasses and wrongs his brother in this manner because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us to impurity but holiness, therefore whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So, so God gives you his Holy Spirit. I want you to kind of catch that and lock it away for the end. God is going to give you his Holy Spirit. He's going to give you something that is his Holy Spirit. Not perfection. He's not going to give you, uh, you know, righteousness and holiness and all that. He's going to give you his Holy Spirit. And then as you partner with his Holy Spirit, you can attain all of these things, right? But he gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God how to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. And we urge you, brothers, do this more and more. So the Thessalonians are doing very good, right? This is not a 1 Corinthians letter where he's just going to rip them to shreds or the Galatians where Paul's going to open up with, you foolish Galatians, who has deceived you? This is, hey, you guys are doing really, really good. This is a good church here. They know how to love each other, right? This is like hilltop. This is not like, no, I'm just kidding. This is like hilltop, though. It is. Uh, Juliet dropped off a roast at my house the other day, and it was amazing. It was wonderful. Thank you all, by the way, for, um, for your, your, your gifts, uh, for our new baby girl, Bailey, who's a month old uh, yesterday, month old. So thank you all for, for being uh, just so generous and kind uh, to my wife and I as we, as we enjoy this newborn season. And we are. It's a good thing that God made them so cute. You know? It's at three in the morning. You're like, ugh. But she is cute. She is real cute. But this is a good church. Hilltop is a good church. If you've never come here before and this is your first time walking in on a Sunday morning, just take it from me. This is a good church. Church? Do you want him to come back? <laughs> Neil, where are you? Thank you. <laughs> this is a good church. You guys are loving each other and keep doing that. Don't stop loving each other. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And this church is a lot like Hilltop. And then Paul says this. He says, I don't need to teach you all that. You already know love. Do it more and more. 
But I will add this, and aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before the outsiders and you may be dependent on no one. That's our theme verse for this, uh, for this series here, that you would aspire to live a quiet life. And the reason why this is such an amazing series is because it's, it's literally the opposite. It's the opposite of what we're taught day in and day out. We're taught about the rat race. You got to get a better job. You got to get a better house. Got to get the next car, next iPhone, the next thing. And you got to make money to do that, which means what? You got to have a side hustle. You've got to be able to work three jobs. That is the rat race. Paul says, take a step back. This is why people are so anxious. You ever wonder, why is anxiety just skyrocketing? It's because we, we are all expected to live a life that we cannot afford. We're all expected to participate in this hustle and bustle when we're supposed to live a quiet life. I don't want all that stuff. I want to live a quiet life. And, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. But it's countercultural because we have to reject what this culture says is successful. The word aspiration. What is your aspiration? Is it to be the top of your class, the top of your field, the best engineer at whatever, GM, wherever you're at? I know there's a lot of engineers. The best summa cum laude in your, in, 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 at your entire college, right? You want to graduate top of your class. You want to be the best lawyer at your firm. You want to be the best, the best, the best. Paul says, aspire to live quietly, keeping to yourself, minding your own business, working with your hands. Aspire to do that. That should be our goal. But we're not taught that. And the enemy is so clever at getting us to when we're trying to be quiet, to engage in noise. He's so good at that. He's given us a cell phone. He's given us a, oh yeah. And now we sit down to be quiet, and what happens? We get noise. He's so tricky. He's a he's tricky little devil. And we go on Facebook and we're like, oh, this would be good. Like, it's going to be good. I'm going to be able to connect with my friends that I don't see and see what's going on and look at all the baby pictures and things like that. And then somebody posts the stupidest post you've ever seen in response to something cultural happening in America. And there's a lot of cultural stuff happening in America. And there's a lot of stupid takes on it. And it's so juicy. Man, that bait. That bait looks so good. I just want a Facebook argument. Actually, that's not what they said. That's not what happened. Oh my gosh. I do this. I'm telling you, this is like my biggest, this is my biggest thing. I've got to learn how to mind my own business. And I know it feels like our business because it's our culture. And you know, I'm not saying like, you know, I, I'm not saying that there's no participation in culture. Obviously there is. Right? The church has to have a voice in the culture. But what I'm saying is, do you feel edified after the Facebook argument? I don't. And yet, I do it. It's like eating, it's like eating a bunch of cake. Like two weeks ago, we had the seniors. I had like four pieces of cake. I just kept going back. And I kept throwing away the plate and the fork too because I didn't want people to know. I didn't want, I didn't want you to see it stacking up. And I felt so gross afterwards. It tasted great in a moment, but it was bad. That's, your, that's the Facebook arguments. <laughs> Again, I'm telling you, this is my fault. Because you know, I, I'm Italian, and it's very easy to, you know, or you get emotional. People wear their emotions on their sleeve, you know. Um, and people give you a little bit of grace when you're an Italian, if you kind of air out your feelings, your emotions, your, your opinion. They give you a little grace because they're, they're Italian. Right? And so do I play into that a little bit? Sometimes, yes. Yeah, I do. But I got to learn how to stop. I got to learn how to pull myself back, and the Lord's been helping me. Um, this is an image of me when somebody posts something on Facebook that I think is dumb. If you want to put that up there, that's me, and then that's the Holy Spirit. This happens, you know, roughly two or three hundred times a day, and 
It's very accurate. Anybody like the Golden Girls? Oh, God, that's the old, old one. Not appropriate. All of you who laugh should take it back. No, but that's what Paul is asking us to do. He's saying, keep to yourself, guys. And we talked about this, you know, all last month. However, what I want to talk about today is not just the idea of living a quiet life, the idea of, like, um, of aspiring to, to, I don't know, live, live simple lives. I want to talk about why. And Paul actually answers the question, why? Well, why, Paul? Why should we want to keep to ourselves? Why should we want to mind our own business? Why should we want to kind of enjoy that solitude, that contentment? Paul's going to say, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as the others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, or a trumpet, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Encourage each other with these words. Love each other. Live quiet lives. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to come back. And there, there's, there will be this second coming, or, or as the theologian N.T. Wright says, the second coming appearing. And, and this idea of the second coming is this Greek word parousia. Parousia. Probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but it's Greek, so I don't care. <laughs> I speak English. I'm sorry. But parousia is this idea of, um, of an emperor's entrance into a city. Right? Think about perusing. If you go, um, like me, when I walk downtown Northville through all the fancy shops and they say, may I help you? I say, I'm just perusing, right? Because I can't afford all of that. But I like to peruse. And so we do a little window shopping, perusing. I'm going to come by to check things out. Specifically, to check out what you did with what I gave you. And so what would happen in Thessalonica is there were actually a lot of earthquakes in this part of the world. There still are today. And during the Roman occupation of this area, if there was an earthquake, the emperor would give a deposit, a sum of money, a gift to the city so that they could rebuild. And you know what you would do with the gift is you would take that money, you would rebuild what was broken down, and maybe you would build like, you know, another elementary school in, the C in Caesar's honor right? Ah, this is your elementary school. And you put a big statue of Caesar out there, but you'd rebuild everything, and then you'd build new things, and you'd do with the money what Caesar wanted you to do with the money. And then Caesar would come back, or the emperor would come back at a time that you don't know, and he would do a parousia. That's the second coming. And in this Perusia, what would happen? This is really interesting. What would happen is he would, he would enter the city and there would be a call out to the city. Attention, the emperor's coming. The emperor's coming. There's a call. And then there would be, guess what? Burp, 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 burp. A trumpet. And, 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 and these Trumpeters would walk in front of the emperor and they'd blow their trumpets and he would come in with this big parade into the city. Right? Do we see that here? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry and a command with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. And then it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, you know what the emperor would do on his second coming to the city? He would first pay homage to those who have died. And he would go through, essentially, the cemetery on the outside of the city, and he would pay respects. The dead in Christ will rise first. And then guess what would happen after that? Well, it says, and then all of us will go and meet him. Yes, all the people 
would hear that the emperor was coming and they would go out of the city to meet him. Paul is very clearly talking about this idea of a parousia, the second coming. But the emperor is not just coming to visit. The emperor is coming because, because he gave you something and he wanted to see what you're going to do with it. That's why he's coming. You don't know when he's coming. But he gave you a deposit and he told you what to do and he's going to come and check your work. When I was in high school, I took your book, one of the easy classes that I could ace. And I remember uh, my teacher was very, Patty Shalter, I loved her. She was very strict though. She was very strict. I don't know if she loved me. I think she did. In her own way. And you'll see why. I, I had to go out and sell ads for the yearbook, right? And so went in my car. I drove to Cutler Dickerson because I was supposed to go check out this uh, farm and feed store. I grew up in Adrian. And so I go to Cutler Dickerson and I walk in and I, my job during this class hour is I'm supposed to sell them an ad, right? Uh, make a little money for the yearbook. And I walk in and there is a large pen of so many little ducks. They were the cutest little ducks, right? And they were only like, I mean, I remember them being only like a dollar. Not even maybe. I think they were, they were practically giving them away, right? They were just going to throw them into a pond. And I said, how much are these ducks? They're like, oh, like a dollar. I said, That's a good deal. Are you, are you a shopper like that? I don't know what I'm shopping for, but when I see a deal, like I don't need that. And I don't want that. But I feel like I'm losing money if I don't get it. So I bought two ducks. And I brought these little ducklings back to school. Did I get an ad? No. No, I didn't. I don't even think I asked. But I walked back into class with a little box. And Mrs. Schalter looked at me from her desk. And she said, did you get the ad? And I said, oh, Ms. Schalter, I got something even better. And I just dumped the bucket, or the, the box, and these ducks jumped out and started running around the classroom. And her face was, it, it was, she was disappointed, we'll say that. But I remember, I remember seeing it kind of like a facepalm moment, like, what? Why did I send him out? Right? I did not get what she expected me to get when she sent me on that mission. I don't want Jesus to come back and have that same expression when he asks me, Casey, what did you do with the Holy Spirit that I gave you? I don't mind disappointing my teachers. I didn't mind disappointing my teachers. I'm getting that come up. It's right now. <laughs> um, but I, I, really, I really do mind disappointing Jesus. And he gave us a deposit the Holy Spirit, and he expects us to do something with it. You'll turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 25. Jesus himself is going to talk about this idea of parousia. He's going to talk about when he comes back, what he's going to be expecting. And you'll hear all the same themes. Starting in verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who has called his servants and entrusted them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who has received the five talents went out at once and traded them and made five more. So also he who had the two talents made two more. But he who received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of whose servants came and settled the accounts with him, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who also had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made you two talents more. 
His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He who also received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and I gather where I do not scatter seed. Then you also, or then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, my coming, I should have received that was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he who has an abundance. But from one the one who has not, even what he has, will be taken away, and they will be cast, and they will be cast uh, the servant into the outer darkness in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The master gave a sum of money, a deposit, and he expected you to do something with it. If the point's not made already, Jesus continues, and he says, "When the Son of Man comes in all his glory, second coming." Perusia, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is saying that. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious, glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you have done it unto me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them and say, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Church, Jesus is coming back. You don't know when, but he will come back and he will expect to see what you did with what he gave you. When Jesus appears and stands before us, we always talk about standing before the Lord. What, what about when he stands before us and goes, I gave you, I gave you this, what'd you do? Are we going to say, oh Lord, look at, look at my job. I started, I started as a janitor at this company and now I'm a, I'm a part owner. <laughs> Isn't that great? Lord, Lord, look, this is, I'll, I'll take you over here, Lord. Look, 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 look at my, my one-bedroom apartment. I started in that one-bedroom apartment, and now look at my house. Look at it. Now that's where I live. See what I did? Look what I did. Jesus, look at, look at my Facebook. I just won a Facebook argument about you. It's pretty sobering. Or will we say, Jesus, let me show you what I did. I was, this Sunday, let me show you where I serve in kids' church. 
where I get to teach the Bible to elementary school kids. I'm going to take Jesus to my little classroom in Northville Christian School, and I'm going to say this, Lord, look at this. This is where I invested everything. Nobody even knows it's here. It smells. It's got, you know, needs new carpet. But Lord, in this room, I've ministered to hundreds of middle schoolers and taught them to love you. And then Lord, Lord, look over here. I've been giving my money to this missionary. Lord, look over here. I, I, look what I did over here. It doesn't look like much, Lord, but, but you know, I was able to help a family out when they needed something. Lord, look here. I didn't get caught up in my, in my career, in my job. Look at my daughter. I'm, I'm present. I'm a present father with my daughter. Guys, what matters is what Jesus expects. Nothing else. And if you're in the room this morning and the Holy Spirit that has been deposited to you is stirring you and convicting you, I pray that you hear His voice. Listen to Him. Obey Everything, everything you're investing in that is not kingdom oriented, you should cut it off. And I'm speaking to myself. We need to hold each other accountable in these ways. What has the priority? Who among you is sick? Who among you needs financial assistance? Who among you needs an encouraging word or prayer? Is there a single mom in your neighborhood who could use a meal, who could use maybe somebody to hold her baby for an hour so she can go take a shower? Church, Jesus is coming back. And we need to be ready. Let's pray. Father, nobody knows the day or the hour except for you. But God, you've revealed to us the simple truth that that you are going to come back. You will return. And when you do, God, you're going to be expecting something from us. And God, I pray that I pray that we'll have something to offer you. I pray that we'll have something to point at. And I pray that you'll be pleased with how we lived our life here on this earth. I pray that you'll be pleased with what we did with the deposit you gave us. And Lord, that eternal life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways, um, one of the ways we help train ourselves to prioritize Jesus is through communion. And you've all received a communion, a communion cup, you've received the communion elements, and if you haven't, we have some ushers who can pass those out and just go ahead and kind of raise your hand and we'll get you a communion element. And I'll read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he gave thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll go ahead and take out the bread. And let's go ahead and pray. Jesus, we remember your body. We remember how it was broken, it was bruised. Lord, you suffered. You took stripes on our back, on your back for our healing. Father, as we remember your broken body, Lord, I pray that we would accept your challenge to be like you. To be willing to be broken. Lord, as you instituted the Last Supper, your word says that you took the bread and you blessed it and you broke it. God, I pray that we would receive the blessing that comes with brokenness. As we examine our hearts before you, Lord, I pray that you would highlight the areas of our body that need to come into submission to you. And God, I pray that you would highlight the areas of our body, that being the church, who are in need. Lord, let us step out of our way to minister to those. And in doing so, we minister to you. In Jesus' name, you can take the bread. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until what? Until he comes. He's coming again. He is coming again. Before we take the cup, I want to read just on in what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let each person examine himself and then, so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body, drinks judgment on themselves. This is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. We often talk about observing our own body. But I want to encourage us to observe in light of today's message in scripture reading to observe the body that is the church. Like I said, who among us is sick? Who among us needs help? This is why many are sick and dying in the Corinthian church. Is the church paying attention to the poor, to those in need? Are they doing what Jesus expected them to do? And so as introspective as we get with communion, I want to encourage you to also think externally. Lord, who in my life needs the talents that you've given me? Who can I invest in? 
So at your second coming, I will have something good to show you. And remember, it's all to the glory of God that you might be sanctified and made like him. And the blood gives us that opportunity. So if you go ahead and open up the cup and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blood you shed. Though our sins were like scarlet, you've made them white as snow. Through the shedding of your blood, you've made a way for us to be made right with you. Jesus, you paid the price we couldn't pay so that we can achieve the reward we could never have gotten on our own. Lord, as we take the cup, I pray that you would that you would stir our hearts to loving our neighbor. That you would highlight to us areas in our life where we're not submitting to your Holy Spirit's sanctifying power. Lord, we remember your price, your sacrifice. We do this in remembrance of you. Let me take the cup. If you'll stand with me. Reading on, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of angels and men, but have not love, I am nothing but a clanging gong. If I have all the knowledge, all the faith, I can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I deliver my body up to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And then he says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Church, as we await the second coming of our Savior, may we learn to love more and more, just as we're doing. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.